Um, this is just the title of the um, the meeting, and um, as Sam said, uh, that's the name of my book. In case you didn't catch it, we are Cuba: How a Revolutionary People Have Survived in a Post-Soviet World. Uh, my book was uh, launched after many years of a lot of hard work and labour of love. It was launched just as lockdown started. So that has obviously had an impact on uh, my ability to get the book out to the world. So um, I hopefully you'll all leave the meeting today with the link, if not having bought the book. Okay, so I'm just going to give a bit of framing and a bit of uh, introduction before Valia talks more in a more focused way about the Cuba's healthcare system and biotech system. The main thing to point out about Cuba's response is it's very swift coordinated state-led response. So if I'm, I'm gonna go through a list of things that were done in Cuba, and you bear in mind that these were measures taken between January, most of us probably admit we had hardly even heard of COVID-19, it was just a small item on the news about some problem in China, um, between January and March. March is important because March the 11th is when they had their first domestic case of COVID-19 in Cuba. It was uh, a case of um, uh, visitors to the island. Okay, so what did they do? Within this, immediately in January, a national commission for COVID-19 was set up. They also um, updated their national action plan for epidemics, which they have uh, anyway. The government scientific councils began to work on combating the coronavirus. So they, did, they weren't dismissive, they took this very seriously. They began um, also COVID-19 response training for border and immigration officials, so ports, airports, um, marines, um, surveillance at all the entry ports, and they drafted a specific prevention and control plan that was uh, drafted in January, it was in place by February. They sent specialists to China, Cuba has a very good relationship in the field of medical science uh, with China. They sent specialists to go and learn from the Chinese to study the behavior of the virus. So they took it very seriously and with due respect to the, the um, Chinese experts. Medical facilities were reorganized so they would have entry points for people who, who had symptoms of COVID-19 to keep them separate from anyone else and so on. And all staff who worked in the healthcare system were trained. And that includes not just the frontline staff for those who are nurses and doctors, but also, for example, porters in the hospitals, um, people who might be in charge of transport for patients. They also received training and they had a sort of triangular format. So the um, directors of provincial uh, healthcare services or, or provincial polyclinics went to Havana, received the training. They went back to their provinces and trained the directors of hospitals and uh, family clinics who trained their own uh, employees who trained you know down and down and down so this was all happening before they even had their own uh, first case in Cuba they set up the government set up a science and biotechnology group so they have um, um, 50 something um, medical science research institutes so they all working together uh, specifically to uh, deal with COVID-19 to, to adapt existing treatments, to work out what might be useful for them, their existing protocol of medicines, antivirals and so on, to develop tests, to start work on vaccines, diagnostics and so on. Um, and from the 10th of March, inbound travellers were tested for COVID-19. Um, so this is all before their first case, right? So then on the 11th of March, they have three Italian tourists who uh, are test, test positive for COVID-19 and they're given healthcare treatment. Um, and immediately the whole of the healthcare authorities in Cuba kicks into action. So they've been laying the groundwork and then they kick into action with organizing meetings in every neighborhood in Cuba. So the family doctors, are speaking, it's organized through the committees for defense of the revolution, the street committees, get people out onto the street, the doctors explain what the symptoms, the, what we know about the virus today, you know, what we should look out for, how we should be behaving and so on. And they start testing and contract tracing is a very, uh, carried out thoroughly and seriously. 
and they also have isolation centers which i'm going to return to later the isolation centers are when someone is detected as having symptoms they're sent to a hospital or polyclinic and if that's confirmed they are sent even if they're asymptomatic i.e they, they're not feeling sick they're sent to an isolation center uh, we'll come back to that so those those elements there i'm going to pass over because this is where valia is going to focus her presentation at the same time a lot of education programs daily information updates possibly the most famous person in cuba at this moment is francisco duran who is the leading epidemiologist epidemiologist, the disease control expert who, who is speaking daily and giving people updates um, and so on. There's been a lot of stuff uh, on the news recently here about how you know people should be given information about what's happening in their local area so they can make decisions. Well, all of that's been going on constantly in Cuba. On the 20th of March, Cuba entered lockdown um following you know most countries did but they were on the, the more strict side so social distancing was obligatory and face masks were obligatory from the beginning um in the street and i think Val is going to talk about a national movement that, that sort of developed around the making of face masks so collective solutions there were lots of economic and welfare protections that were brought in recognizing the uh, detrimental impact that this could have on individuals. So um, uh, self-employed people and small businesses were exempt from tax. Um, domestic debts were suspended. Utility bills were suspended from April. Salaries were guaranteed up to 50% for people who were hospitalized. And um, social security was uh, enhanced and extended and family assistance for people on low income, uh, in low income families. So, food, medicine and so on was delivered to people's homes um, where there were vulnerabilities and they couldn't get out or they needed assistance with purchasing that. The provincial and municipal defence councils were activated. Those exist to deal with all sorts of uh, um, civil defence problems, natural disasters, I'll mention those again. And um, also Cubans developed their own phone app, which has been functioning, I think, since March. Uh, where it's a voluntary app that people could log on to and, and um, you know, log, log symptoms for virtual screening. On the 24th of March, Cuba closed its borders to non-residents. This was a very difficult and a very big decision for Cuba because um, tourism is the second most significant source of revenue. You have to remember when we talk about Cuba's economy that all of its economic decisions and options are determined by a very punitive, very um, relentless United States blockade. And tourism is, is, has, uh, because of this, become um, a source of great dependence for the Cubans. But they had to prioritize uh, human welfare over the economy. So tourism was closed down. Um, those who were Cuban, lived in Cuba, whether they were Cubans or not, were able to return to Cuba, but they had to enter a supervised quarantine under a testing regime um, with medical assistance there. So now I'm going to move on and talk about, uh, you know, because these things don't just happen out of the blue. Cuba's um, capacity and its disposition to respond in that way is the result of certain features of Cuban development. And I'm going to quite quickly run over five features of Cuba's socialist development, which help us to understand the way that Cuba reacted. And again, the first couple of these are um, overlapping with Valia, so I'm just going to mention them. The first is that Cuba has a single, universal, free public healthcare system. So it's not a dual track system. We have a national health service uh, in Britain, which provides still some services for free, but there is a parallel service system. So you can opt out and, and take private health care. So in the case of Cuba, that's not an option. The other important element is the focus on prevention before cure and the network of family doctors responsible for community health who live among their patients. They provide healthcare 24 hours a day, um, and it's a mixture of consultants, uh, consultant appointments, so they people coming into the family doctor and then visiting the family home. So the idea of doctors visiting homes and, and inquiring about the health of people in their homes is part of the system. 
and I won't talk more about that because I'm sure Vali is going to provide you some statistics and outlines and we're going to see a video as well. Okay, so the second important feature is Cuba's biopharma industry, which is driven by public health needs, not by the pursuit of profit. There are no private interests. There is no speculation involved. Things are produced not to make money on the market, but because they are meeting the public health need. Um, the, bio, the biopharma sector produces nearly 70% of the medicines that are consumed in in Cuba domestically. Um, they have had problems recently because of the tightening of the US blockade by Trump, which has stopped them getting some of the inputs that they need to produce medicines. So we're seeing a um, very worrying emergence of some scarcity of medicines. Um, and But in addition to supplying a large proportion of their own needs, they also export um, biotech products to 50 countries around the world. They also have joint ventures in um, nine countries last time I looked in the Global South, but I think the number is increasing um, quite regularly. Okay, so the next feature is the uh, experience in civil defense and disaster, disaster risk reduction, which is usually, as I said, in response to climate related and natural disasters. It is quite an experience being in Cuba during a hurricane. I've been in Cuba during Category 4 hurricane and it was really remarkable how everybody knew what their role was. If this was going to be um, you know, a devastating uh, climate event, everybody knew where they should be, who they should be looking after. And the other aspect of this was, um, you know, it wasn't that everyone was left to fend for themselves. There was a really collective community response. So some people were responsible for taking the vulnerable, the elderly and children into shelters. Other people were responsible for getting out as soon as possible to get rid of uh, deluge and, and make sure there was no flooding and so on and so forth. And um, that system, which has been internationally applauded and recognized, I mean, Cuba is regarded by international institutions as a model for responding to these sorts of disasters. Um, it, it is based on the ability to mobilize national resources to protect human life. That is the priority. And it is achieved because they have an incredible network of grassroots organizations which facilitate communication and community action. I already mentioned the CDRs, the Committees for the Defense of the Revolution, the street committees, but there are also the popular councils, um, which are like local governance, there are the Women's Federation the university students who all play a role and they coordinate between them. So it's always this idea of a community and collective responses with the attention of, of safeguarding human beings. The fourth feature is their experience um, that Cuba has in operating infectious disease controls and particularly border controls. So uh, Cuba is a tropical country. They face many infectious diseases, um, many of which wiped out uh, by the post-1959 revolutionary government because of its outstanding healthcare system. Um, but in addition to that, for decades, Cuba has sent healthcare professionals to countries which have in, uh, infectious diseases that have long since been eradicated in Cuba. And at the same time, it has invited tens of thousands of foreigners from those countries to study in Cuba. I'm thinking particularly of the 1970s when um, you know, the Cubans were uh, helping in most of the countries in Africa actually to establish public healthcare systems and um, then inviting people from those countries to Cuba to study. And the first thing that they had to do when they arrived in Cuba, is they'd go to the Institute of uh, the Hospital of Tropical Diseases, the IPK, IPC, the IPK, and they would um, first of all be tested for all of these infectious diseases and spend time in quarantine. So Cuba already has a well-developed procedure for quarantining people who are either entering the country or re-entering the country. So they knew how to do this. Um, it's something that I've never experienced happening in Britain. Okay, and then the final feature was Cuban medical internationalism because um, there, although we're talking about how Cuba has got COVID-19 under control, we have to recognize its contribution 
for getting it under control beyond its own borders and around the world in many countries. And I know Vali is going to talk about that. But just to point out, again, this is not something new. This is part of the, the historical trajectory of the Cuban Revolution. And it's a key feature of it, which is its internationalism. Before the pandemic began, 400,000 Cuban healthcare professionals had already provided healthcare, which is free at the point of delivery for underserved populations in 164 countries. At the time when the COVID-19 was announced to be a, a pandemic, Cuba had 28,000 medical professionals already serving in 59 countries when the pandemic began. And most of you will have heard about the uh, brigades of specialists, of uh, disease control specialists and disaster response specialists from the Henry Reef that they've sent around the world. But um, the, the point is also that the healthcare workers they had um, in those countries have also been assisting with the, the major healthcare issue in many countries of COVID-19. Okay, so um, I don't know if you can see exactly what I can see because I need to move this here and you can, uh, if you can see the, is that a hexagon? I can't remember, it's a long time since I did my GCSE maths. But the, the green thing there, um, this is in Spanish, but you'll see the total number of deaths in Cuba is 87. Now I wrote an article about Cuba's response to COVID-19. I think I said at the end of May it was 82. So you can see that for a very long period, um, the, de the number of people who have died from COVID-19 in Cuba has only increased by a very small amount. And that's why I think it is possible to talk about Cuba having got COVID-19 under control, not eliminated it, it's still in circulation within the population, but they are using their medicines to um, certainly uh, control the number of people who are, who are uh, severely affected and they're being very successful in that regard. Cuba's outstanding domestic and international response um, really worse some analysis that a small island nation which has been subjected to hundreds of years of colonialism and imperialism and since the revolution of 1959 to six decades of the criminal United States blockade which let's be clear includes medical equipment and medicines that it can play such an exemplary role is due to Cuba's socialist system. Why? The collective approach, the community approach, the human development approach, yes, but also because Cuba runs under, a, is directed by a central plan which directs natural, national resources according to a development strategy which prioritizes human welfare and community participation, not profit. So they don't have to negotiate with private interests and corporations and multinationals and foreign investors when they make decisions about how they will um, you know, take certain measures in the interest of, of the population or you know, the cost that they don't have to negotiate with anyone about the cost of sending the Henry Reeve contingents to assist other nations. And those things are driven by ideological principles. And you know, for 40 years, maybe 50 years since neoliberalism set down deep economic and ideological roots, we have been told that only the market can bring efficient outcomes. And what we've seen in, in the response to COVID-19 in the uh, richest, uh, most advanced capitalist countries has been an utter shambles, but it's not a coincidence. It's not because there's, you know, what, wallies in government, which may well be the case, but it is a result of the market-driven system because what we see, what has been proven, is that profit-seeking markets cannot mobilise the resources that are needed to deal with this kind of global health crisis. They are incapable of um, responding in a collective way that puts human welfare first. And so we have to bring into question the very meaning of the word efficiency. And I think that um, really when you look at Cuba, not only have they dealt with the COVID-19 outbreak efficiently, but they have also done that 
under siege, under renewed aggression from the United States as a, um, a country which is really struggling in terms of resources uh, under that pressure. And um, it really needs to make us think about the role of the state versus the market in, in development. And I'm going to stop there and pass over to Valia. Thank you. I will stop sharing. I, I talked about the isolation centres. So this is when people um, were confirmed, uh, two, two ways they were used. One, when they were confirmed as having COVID-19, even if they didn't have symptoms, they were sent to isolation centres. So they weren't just told, stay at home, you know, resolve your own shopping problems. They were um, sent to isolation centres where they were under med uh, medical supervision. And this is a video. This is the other um, people who went there were those who were entering Cuba. Okay, and this is the case of this woman. Here we go. My name is Monica Rivero. I'm a Cuban journalist and I was studying in the United States and because of the coronavirus crisis, I decided to come back to Cuba. was taken to these students dorms south of Havana with more than 200 other people. We are coming from United States, Dominican Republic, Turkey, Canada, Spain, Italy. Vengo de Italia y veía cómo moría las personas 700, 500, 600 diarios. Decidía quién vivía, quién moría. Sinceramente yo me siento más segura aquí en mi país. Everybody has felt pretty confident in the health system because with all the limited resources we have, Q1 doctors have more experience working in hard situations. Mira, cariño. Gracias. The doctors and nurses are really nice. They change your mask, they check your temperature three times a day. There is not much to do here. Mostly people spend time on their phone, they read, they talk about the crisis, they follow the news. Some walking around just to keep moving. You have funny things like the guy who knows his family is waiting for him to put him in charge of all the shopping. So he says, I'm fine here, I don't have any worry here whatsoever, so I'm good, I'm not in a rush to leave something very surprising how close people have uh, become in the only two weeks I've been in a room for, with other three women and we consider ourselves friends now Three days ago we did the test, everyone was negative, still we were instructed to finish the quarantine. Every night at 9 p.m., like in the rest of the island, everyone in the center claps to give thanks to the doctors. The biggest applause was the day before we finally uh, went home. talk a little bit about something that Helen has already mentioned, but before I want to start giving you a, a picture of how the health system in Cuba is organized, because the success in Cuba in handling COVID-19 has not been just a coincidence. It is based on the infrastructure that Cuba has been building over the years. So, as you know, the, the resources in Cuba are centralized, uh, are centralized, and then the government gives uh, the public health ministry the, the, the resources and the money that they need to spend in the, at the different levels. So, we have three levels of organization. So, in the third level, we have institutions that are national dependency, like 
a research and medical institutes and very high specialized hospitals. We have a second level of attention of care that are at the level of the pro different provinces in Cuba, where also you have hospitals and they are subordinated to the provincial health uh, authorities. And then you have the third levels of care that are, uh, are, are organized at the level of the different municipality in each of the in each of the provinces, where also you have hospitals, and there you have also the health communities, uh, the health area, no? uh, and the community. Under this level, you have polyclinics, and these polyclinics they uh, do they offer ambulatory assistance to to everybody, to the population. So they are organized geographically in the different geographic uh, areas. And under them, you have the family medicine. And also in the first level of attention, you have other uh, municipal units that I'm going to talk about later. So here, under the first levels of attention, of care, uh, they, they are paying attention to residents according to the geographic area. And here, at the level of the, and also at the level of the, of the province, and in the third level of attention, they pay, uh, they take care of, of everybody according to, according to the needs. So this is the organization of our health, uh, health system. So in general, in Cuba, we have 150 hospitals and 449 polyclinics organized in that way, as I already explained. And under them, we have about uh, 11,000 family doctor's offices. Uh, at the level of the municipality, then we have other units uh, like maternal homes where they take care of pregnant women that they present some type of risk. We have elderly homes and grandparent houses. See, these grandparent houses are social places where they, besides socialize, they also enroll in rehabilitation and, and exercises programs. We have psychopedagogic medical centers, block banks, and then uh, about between 12, no, if this is a statistic 2019, so we have 12 medical and research institutes that they are specialized in the different medical specialties. So in that way, we have the Neurology and Neurosurgery Institute, we have the Endocrinology Institute, this one that I, I am showing here, that is cardiolo Cardiology and Cardiovascular Surgery Institute, uh, and so on. And in this institute, they pay medical attention to people, but also they are, uh, they carry out uh, research. As Helen said, the, the Cuban health system is universal and free and also provide a full uh, coverage. And he is focused more in prevention than in, in cure. Also is regionalized, as I already explained, by geographical areas, and is based uh, primarily, because of that, in the primary health care, in the community practice, and also have an intersectorial approach. The system has a very tight uh, interrelationship with other sectors and organizations, as the biomedical sector, and the scientific sector, that that allows that everything that is developed here is immediately applied in the Cuban health systems and in the other way around. The, 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 the different projects and, and scientific um, uh, yeah, projects that are carried carry out, they are responding, uh, responding to the needs of the Cuban health system. What we do in Cuba is apply, uh, is apply research. We do a very small percentage of basic research, and the basic research is also with the, with the, the final goal is always to have a, an exit that could be later uh, applied or translated. For to a medical uh, uh, or to, for for a solution of a medical problem or in other type of research to a social to a social problem and in the middle of all this you have the community participation a participation that also is established 
uh, through the what we call mass organization. I don't know whether this is a correct translation in English. This is a people organization where you have the CDR, the women's uh, organization, all of them at the level of the, the of the of the of the, neck, the the community at the level of the of the issue of the neighborhood. So this system has a influence that today the main causes of death in Cuba are non-transmissible diseases, like, sorry, this is in Spanish, I couldn't, I didn't have time to do a translation, like heart diseases, cancer, and cerebro cerebrovascular uh, diseases. Those are the first three causes of death in Cuba in, in the last, uh, in the last, and um, for more than five, for more than five uh, uh, years. So, uh, as also you know, probably most of you know, the population in Cuba is a little more than 11 million. For those 11 million people, we have been training and more than uh, 97,000 doctors, of which 47, more than 47,000 has been trained as family doctors. Of them, 26,000 are still working in the community. Why 26 of 47? Because after they are family doctor, they could also, after some year, be, be trained in another specialty, and they don't work anymore at the level of the community, but they are more specialized. But of those 47, 26,000 are still working uh, in the family uh, medicine practice. And we have a more than 84,000 nurses. So those, uh, these uh, human resources, that is one of the, the principal, uh, how can I say, is a treasure for Cuba. So with Cuba treasure more is the human resources that we have and that we have been training over the years. So, they, we have organized this program that is the family uh, doctor and nurse program that they work and that is called a basic work unit. This basic work unit has a, is a focus in the three different levels, in the individual, in the family, and in the community, uh, taking into account the environment. And then different programs are implemented. We have a very complete vaccination program that uh, all children in Cuba are vaccinated. That is a reality that is different to other countries. And that is one of the reasons that many infectious diseases, transmissible diseases, have been banned uh, in Cuba. But it's also addressed to the family and to the community. To the community uh, with training program, with without reaching uh, the people, that is another characteristic of this program. It's not only a doctor that is sat all the time in a practice, but it's a doctor that goes to the community to look for the patient. And they, this system is organized in a way that the population is classified and every doctor in his community know how many diabetics, how many hypertensives, how many people with different chronic diseases they have, how many pregnant uh, women. So each of the child in which age group they, they are and so on. And they deal with other social problems like uh, attendance to the school, uh, families with social uh, dysfunctionalities uh, and so on. In general, we have in Cuba more than 11,000 uh, basic work units in which they are working 26,173 uh, uh, family doctors. So besides that, as Helen was mentioning, Cuba has been exercising the International Medical Assistance or collaboration. So the first medical brigade was sent to Chile after a earthquake in 1960. And in the 1962, Fidel announced in a speech that he was uh, given to the medical students in the medical school, uh, Victoria de Giron, the decision of the government to offer free, uh, free medical assistance to countries uh, that needed. 
And in the in the 1973, the first brigade went to Argelia, and six, uh, 56 uh, doctors stayed for uh, 14 months there uh, treating a patient. So that was the beginning of Cuban medical internationalism. So here I, I wrote, so for you, if you are interested in, in the different decades, how many, in how many countries Cuba has been paying, uh, giving medical assistance for free in this, uh, as a, um, in a way of solidarity and as a medical inter internationalist. However, in the 90s, uh, so Cuba has to face another context. And was the collapse, as you know, of the socialist bloc and the disintegration of the Soviet Union, which Cuba, uh, with whom Cuba has uh, the main market. So Cuba enters in a, in a special uh, period that was also a uh, titan, but an upsurge of the US blockade uh, to Cuba. That put Cuba in a very difficult uh, situation. And then the international help started to decrease, and a new program started that was the compensated technical assistance and direct contract. contract. And I'm talking about this a little bit because this issue has been a little polemic uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic with Cuba doing collaboration and has been used by Trump uh, government to attack Cuba. So I want to I wanted to explain I want to explain this a little bit in the way that everybody understands uh, what is going on. So uh, so as I was saying, because of this uh, adverse economical uh, situation is that the compensated technical assistance and direct contract started where the doctor were were paid a little bit of money, and the rest of the money was uh, going to support the, the collaboration and also uh, the sustain of the of the Cuban uh, health system. So in 1998, if you maybe you don't remember, but I think even the uh, United Kingdom was uh, harmed by this. So we have the Hurricane Mish and the Hurricane George, two very bad hurricanes that, uh, in which many people died in Central America, especially in, in Honduras and Nicaragua, and caused damage over six billion dollars. Uh, and also we have the Hurricane George also causing more than 30, 13, almost 14 billion dollars damage that affected uh, mainly the Caribbean, uh, the Caribbean island. So given to that situation, the countries in the area start to ask for, for help. And then Cuba, as in response to that, canceled the debt to Nicaragua that was over $50 million uh, and offered medical and paramedical help. And also asked, Fidel asked to the international community to contribute with equipment and medicine while Cuba was providing uh, the human resources or the medical uh, assistance. So that was like in different moments during November and December, different medical brigades uh, flew to Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Haiti, providing medical assistance for, for free. So then with the time, so uh, about that time in the in the 98, 92, with the special period and the disasters in this area because of the uh, the hurricane, so was when I started the comprehensive uh, health program that uh, we call in Cuba programas de atención integral (PIS) that started in November 1998. The principle of that program where we provide free medical assistance to countries are sending medical professionals, oh sorry, and health technicians for free that are, uh, this help is mainly in the primary care and this doctor only receives pocket money by the countries where they are going while they are providing free assistance and uh, at attention uh, at the point of care. So they work in rural areas, that areas that are remote, remote, the difficult access, deprived of medical assistance forever. 
uh, most of them, they have never seen a doctor. They work, however, under the country law and without intervening in political issues. So the first uh, comprehensive health program was established in Central American and the Caribbean, and later was extended to Africa and the Pacific. And as a support of this, in November 99, the Latin American School of Medicine was created to make the program more uh, sustainable and able to continue on, on, on time. It's in that way that this is a statistic of, of 2019. Under this uh, comprehensive health, health, health uh, program, or PIS, we are providing free assistance to these countries in the Americas, the Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Southeast Asia and the Pacific. And this is free, and this is today. Besides uh, uh, the establishment of this free health uh, medical uh, assistance program has made a, 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 a big impact in some of the country. For example, this is the child mortality and the maternal mortality in some of these countries. Sorry, again, the, the slide is in Spanish. For example, you can see here in Gambia, how the child mortality drop, and this is per 10,000 um, child, um, uh, from 121 to 61, and in Ghana, for 66 to 10, uh, and so on. And in the case of ma maternal mortality, again, you can see here the case of Ghana, and even the case of Haiti, with the maternal mortality have decreased in more than, uh, in almost uh, half. So together with this, Cuba has been providing help in natural disasters for many countries for many years. From the 60s, with the first health that I already explained to Chile because of the earthquake, until the 2000s uh, with the different, uh, with the dengue pandemic also in Central, uh, in Central America. And all this medical help, Cuba has sustained it for free. So in 2005, then the hurricane uh, Katrina happens, and Fidel, this whole way has been the leader and a visionary, uh, proposed to create an international brigade of doctors that could be uh, specialized in disasters and in serious uh, uh, epidemics, and they were trained for that in a way that they were already ready at the moment when this uh, natural disaster happens. So in 2006, this brigade was put together and as a way of offering help to the United States, a, a help that was, a, a, that was not accepted, of course, unfortunately. Um, the, today, uh, the, this brigade, that is the Henry Reef Brigade, that is called International Medical Brigade uh, Henry Reef, is composed by 10,000 members, and four, more than 4,000 of them has assisted different disasters in Guatemala, Pakistan, Bolivia, Indonesia, Mexico, Peru, um, and China at different moments. Here you have the statistic of how many collaborators, how many of them has been doctor in each of these uh, countries. But also they have been working during Haiti uh, earthquake in 2010 and the, during the cholera outbreak that happened the same year with more than a, a 900 collaborators. So Cuba has been one of the, was sustaining the biggest collaboration with Haiti during the two uh, during these two disasters. And of course, all of you know the participation of Cuba during the Ebola uh, epidemic in these three countries, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, where Cuba sent 256 uh, uh, volunteers in 2007. So besides that, Cuba sustained the medical cooperation, the medical cooperation that I already said. This medical cooperation, doctor perceived a salary, keep their salary in Cuba, where they are working to work abroad, they receive part of his, uh, uh, his compensation in, in, in uh, hard currency, and another percent is received for the country that is used to be a rainbows in, in, the health, in the Cuban health systems and in, in, in other areas. And 
I, I believe and I defend that it is fair because if some country has the money to pay for the Cuban cooperation to a country that is a struggling for, for surviving, but it's fair to do it. But those countries that doesn't have the money still receive the medical cooperation uh, for free. So today, medical cooperation is covered through this modality, the comprehensive health program that is free, the remunerated technical assistance, we have different programs that I have not mentioned that Cuba has established that they started with Venezuela and then has been expanding to the Caribbean and Africa. But we also offer medical education and training. And then we have the Henry Reef Emergency Medical Contingent or Brigade that also offer free assistance during the disaster. But Cuban medical assistance goes beyond that also works in epidemiologic, sorry, epidemiological control in the country where they go, in sanitary campaigns and vaccination. They train staff. They do consulting, local consult, consulting, but also they offer consulting through the whole uh, World Health, uh, Health Organization and the Pan American Health Organization. And they also do postgraduate and undergraduate uh, So that was the scenario when we had the first SARS-CoV-2 case in March 2020. A population of 11,000 with this amount of doctors and about 62,000 uh, students uh, in the medical school. At the same time, we have 32 pediatric ICU, 27 medical surgical ICU, 39 general ICU and 120 municipal ICU that mainly what they do is to offer uh, emergency uh, care for patients that arrive and then they transfer patients to a more specialized uh, ICU like, like this one. So it was good, but not enough for facing a pandemic where you have 11,000 uh, inhabitants. So uh, still, you will need it take other measures to be able to, to, to face the, pan, the, the, the pandemic because uh, uh, even with a very good uh, health system, it was uh, facing the possibility to collapse. It's in that way that Cuba started to apply the experience that Cuba has in epidemiological vigilance with active screening an active screening that was, was door to door, reaching people in their houses, and also applying contact tracing. And so a person was suspicious or a patient was diagnosed with COVID-19 and it started from that point, the, the system was tracing the family doctors and the team was tracing all possible contacts of that person and also doing border vigilance. And, and this program, active screening, contact tracing, and border vigilance, as Helen said, were not new for Cuba. We have dengue, we are paying assistance also in Central American countries where, where they have faced Zika and Chikungunya. We are going to Africa also, where our collaborators are facing other diseases like malaria that is banned in Cuba. So you have also tuberculosis, many other programs. So we, we need to keep constant border vigilance and contact tracing. The experience of co contact tracing was also very important and developed when the, the, the AIDS started, the epidemic of AIDS started in the war and of course, Cuba was part of that. So also tracing all possible contacts of people that were detected that infected with, a, with, a, with AIDS. So with that, Cuba also implemented isolation. Isolation that was stratified was not the same the isolation for people that were contact, that for people that were uh, suspicious that for travelers. So we have different centers. We also did isolation in houses for, uh, for people that were suspicious of, of probably having um, COVID-19 and isolation in centers for travelers. And another thing that was very, very important was daily communication with the population. That daily communication with Dr. Durand, that is the director of epidemiology, he sits and still he does it every day on TV 
at 10 o'clock in the morning, informing the Cuban population of all cases. For example, this was today. How many cases were confirmed? Where the, which the, uh, uh, who the person is, is it a citizen, whether it's male or female, how old it is, where in which municipalities is living, whether have condition that is worsening the perspectives of the diseases or not, and so on, and how many possible contacts that person has. And that is informed to the population for each of the person that is detected every day at 10 o'clock and is updated. Also, how many people has been in ICU, how many are critical, how many, how many are seriously ill, how many have died. So there is a daily report on TV. There is also a website that this information is uploaded. But also there is a working group. I don't know whether you can see my, my, point, my pointer. Yeah, okay, great. So this working group where the, where the prime minister that is here and the president of Cuba is meeting regularly with all the people in charge of the different uh, areas facing the pandemic, from the Ministry of Health to the, to the science sector and industry uh, regularly, uh, every week. And also you have Providence on TV where the president go with the prime minister and also the different ministries in the different ministries go to explain the population, the new measure, and what they are going to do. Cuba needs to reorganize itself com completely. Uh, and then that was affecting each of the different areas of, of the country. So there is the government follow-up and a coordination of a four that is done in this working group. This is today, uh, this is 30 of July, so it was yesterday, uh, statistics. So uh, still we have 86 uh, people have uh, died. Uh, it has not increased uh, for a while. We didn't have anyone uh, critically ill or seriously ill for many, for many days. So today there is one, unfortunately. And this is the amount of confirmed cases until, uh, until the moment since the pandemic uh, start. So this is one of the strategies that has been uh, active screening and contact tracing. Um, please, Jacob, if you can run the video. Es una enfermedad que está azotando a todos los países en el mundo. Nuestro país no es la excepción. El médico de familia en estos momentos juega un papel fundamental. Vive en la comunidad. No esperamos que acudan al médico de familia, sino que vamos activamente a sus casas. Buenos días. Estamos en el policlínico. A veces hay alguna persona con fiebre, con catarro, con síntomas respiratorios. están incorporados a las acciones de pesquisa, tratando de llegar a todos los cubanos en el menor tiempo posible para evitar la transmisión de esta enfermedad. Los mismos médicos que nos dan clases dicen que es una cosa que antes nunca se había visto. Obviamente estoy preocupada, pero bueno, yo elegí ser médico y es lo que me toca. ¿Tienen más miedo o más optimismo? Optimismo, optimismo siempre. siempre. ¿Qué clase de médico seríamos si no tuviéramos pesimismo? llegado aún al pico máximo de los casos. Estamos trabajando para modificar el curso de la enfermedad, identificando al enfermo y aislándolo y tomando las medidas de prevención con la población sana. ¿Tienes confianza en el sistema de salud de Cuba para poder enfrentar? Plenamente. ¿Por qué confías tanto? Porque son unos, unos mejores médicos del mundo. Yo soy persona de riesgo, ¿no? Porque yo soy amática y hipertensa. Siempre, los médicos siempre están chequeando más ahora y le agradezco muchísimo a ustedes. Me hace sentir muy orgulloso que nuestra población sienta que las cosas que hacemos pues, les son de, de beneficio. 
realmente esa es nuestra, nuestra razón de ser. The students were incorporated to this. At the beginning, there was polemic, and then everything that happened in Cuba is about talking to the population and explaining why to the population. A student needed to go there first because they are medical students. They wanted to be doctors, so they, they should be part of that school. And also because, irrespective of how good the medical doctors are, the, su the success in the pandemic was about identifying early enough the cases for stopping the transmission. And that is why active screening and contact tracing has been capital, essential, in the way that Cuba has faced the pandemic. And this, that has been different to the UK, for example. And another thing that has been different to the UK also is that Cuba asked the patient to stay at home. They were treated at home. And only when they had symptoms, they were going to the, uh, uh, sorry, they were going, sorry, the Cuba asked the patient to go to the, to the health system, to go to the family doctor, not like here, stay at home, don't go until you have a specific thing. That was just the opposite because the, the system was interested in knowing early enough when patients have very early symptoms. So, uh, okay, sorry. Okay, so the program uh, to fight against, against COVID-19 was structured in this way. So for the healthy people, there was, uh, the system was doing active screening, asymptomatic identification, uh, promoting social distancing. If you know Cubans, you, you, you know how hard it is for Cubans to do social distancing. So we are a country, we, we, are, we, we, we are used to live very close to each other and talk to each other. So social distancing has been very challenging and it still is very challenging and epidemi epidemiologic uh, vigilance. For patients with uh, COVID-19 that were confirmed, they were admitted in the hospital or ICU, depending how, how they were. And then you have protocol for management and treatment, so that were established. Also, protocol for manage, management and treatment were established at the level of the community for healthy uh, people, and I'm going to talk about that later. And then for the recovered patients, they continue the epidemiologic vigilance and the follow-up. But also, okay, as Helen said, we stopped transportation, we closed the border, which is very tricky for Cuba, and we work in, in, in the awareness of social uh, distancing. The, the border closure is particularly tricky because as Helen said, we depend on not only in tourism, but we, we are an island. Everything comes mainly through, through the airport and the other uh, a part come through, through, uh, from, from sea from sea via, via the sea. So that was very tricky. So Cuba has been, a, it has, was faced with the need, the Cuban government was faced with the need to start distributing everything that, uh, the, the, that, was, a, that was existing in the country, in the different municipalities, in the different neighborhoods, in the way that was accessible to the population because all the transportation was stopped. People were not able to move from one municipality from one neighborhood to another one, except using the bike or, 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 or walking. So it was very hard. And if you have been in Cuba, you know that you struggle. Still, when, when you have transportation, you need to move a lot to find the things that you need. So it has been tricky. And the government had to deal with that, with distributing food for people in the different neighborhood and municipality for people have access to the things that, that they needed. So things that were, in, that were usually commercialized in, in convertibles were then passed to Cuban pesos. And even the, the, the Cuban, the, the products that were normally acquired freely in Cuban convertible, then they were regulated. Because in the same way that here in the UK, 
you had people that started accumulating because of anxiety. So the same thing happening to Cuba, or even more, because we, we are lacking uh, we are lacking product, and then the border uh, was closed. So that has been very tricky, and it still is very tricky for the for, for the government because they still the borders are closed. A new measure has been implemented in the new in the last weeks to be able to start uh, recovering from the crisis that the COVID-19 have uh, created. So besides that, uh, phases were uh, established as mandatory and social distancing is also reinforced by, by the police, the same way that the, the, the face marks is, is also reinforced for the police and penalties are imposed to people that don't wear a face mask. Together with this has been several initiatives in the population because we didn't have face masks. It's not like the Asian country or we didn't have shops would, would go to buy this facial, facial mask. And then the community mobilized itself, the social, uh, the civil society in Cuba to give a response to that, uh, to that need. And then please, uh, Jacob, can you run this small video? Yo me llamo Evangelina Navalón Ceballos. Yo empecé a hacerlo en la Le empecé a hacer con mis propios medios. Pero es fácil en casa. Cojo una tela, la divide en tres partes iguales. La cose en los extremos. La vira, hace dos pliegues, cose a los lados y busca una tira larga que le coja toda la cabeza. Le monta la tira aquí en el medio, cose a los lados y ya está el nasaú. Miren cómo queda. Voy ahora por 255 personas. Priorizo a los viejos. No cobro un medio, no quiero nada de dinero. Feliz me siento de hacer esto. And together with this, I have to say that not only the, 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 the community mobilized to, to produce fast, f f uh, face masks, but also the private sector helped producing uh, face shields using uh, 3D printers that they already have in the different business. So it has been a joint uh, a jo a combination of the uh, state uh, sector or the government, governmental sector and the private sector to fight together the pandemic. So, but besides that, Cuba also has uh, an infrastructure of biomedicine and science that has, that has been very, it has been fundamental for basing the COVID-19. So the BioCuba Pharma is a, um, we call enterprise, but it's a governmental enterprise under which all the scientific centers are uh, organized. All of them producing different type of uh, products that are supporting the health system uh, in Cuba and the pharmaceutical uh, industry. So in as early as in 1960, Fidel said in, in, in that speech, which when Cuba barely have any scientific infrastructure, that Cuba future must necessarily be a future of people of science. And that was a premonition because that is one of the biggest infrastructure that Cuba has and has been fundamental for fighting uh, the COVID. So BioCuba Pharma with all its center is working in 15 projects for COVID-19. Six are treatment projects, six are related to prevention at risk groups, two are diagnostic projects, and one is a medical device. Uh, nine are undergoing clinical trial, and six are still in research and development uh, phase. There is also other projects that are in early stages, like the UNE specific vaccine for boosting uh, natural immunity, and one specific SARS-CoV-2 vaccine that is being developed by, by, by the biotechnology uh, set. So the, when the COVID-19 started, already we have many products, already we have many products that have been developed and approved 
for human use. So, and what Biocoba Pharma and the different centers did was starting to redirect the application of this product to use it in COVID-19. Uh, in, COVID, uh, in a way that uh, there is 17 national products that are being used to help patients and two uh, products only are uh, imported. At the community level, so that is the strategy of care, so they are using active screening and they are using a product that is a national product that is called Prevengovir. And in social institutions then, for older people fundamentally, they are using the biomodeling T that is increasing the, the, the immunity in people promoting the, the response of the T cells in the body. So here is the amount of people between brackets that has been uh, treated with this product. At the level of the surveillance center for travelers, they are using also the Prevengovir, that is the national product, but also the, 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 the biomodulin for people uh, over 60 years old and transfer factor that is produced in the biotechnology center for people below 60. This is also for boosting immunity. In the center with uh, COVID-19 suspicious individuals, then they are using uh, antibiotics like azithromycin and this olcetamivir that is the name of, that is also commercialized as Tamiflu. So everybody knows this is for influenza flu treatment and interferon alpha 2V that has been, uh, that is produced uh, 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 by Cuba. Uh, and then for patients with COVID-19, they are using this retroviral, retroviral that is imported, that is Caletra, besides the chlorokine and interferon, both produced by Cuba, and in critical ill, then they use other products also produced by Cuba, like the erythropoietin. This peptide that has been proven very uh, good at boosting the immunity and has been uh, this has been a clinical trial with very favorable uh, results in critical ill patients. That is CIV, that is Biotechnology Center 258. So all these products, most of them, the 19 of, uh, 17 of them are national products again and imported like the Caletra and the, uh, uh, the Oseltamide. Besides that, we have the Immune State Center the Immunisay Center already has a very long expertise developing kits for many diseases in the way that besides using the standard way of a, a detecting or diagnosing COVID-19 with rapid, a rapid test and a, a antibody test, Cuba developed a, a rapid diagnostic kit for testing uh, the, the immunity of population, so the amount of um, antibody, the immunoglobulin G that the population has, that is giving you the level of immunity for exposition that the population already has. So that was developed in very little time by this center, again, not by a coincidence, but because it has a long tradition producing other type of key. So then there is the Cuban Neuroscience Center with a long tradition producing medical devices that is going to, uh, with, with going, is going to have ready for October 2020, 100 ventilators for, for patients, 250 in basis, 250 not in basis. And the problem was that the ventilators that normally Cuba, Cuba didn't have enough ventilator. It was not able to, to acquire ventilators in the market but because the companies that normally uh, used to sell those ventilators to Cuba, they were bought by the uh, US uh, company and the blockade forbid this company to provide Cuba with new equipment or with spare parts. So Cuba has to find a solution, and that was the task given to the Cuban Neuroscience Center that is also part of the BioCuba uh, Pharma. So then, in, again, this uh, way of organizing the system was you have 
the human resources and an, an education educational system uh, providing the students you have the technology and the industry you have already products that are intellectual property and you have a national health system the integration of all that what was a uh, put Cuba in a position to face a uh, COVID-19. So this is the, how Cuba is in the last uh, month, that is in July. In red, you have the number of deaths that you can see has been, has stayed uh, the same for, for many days now, so in 86. So you have the number of cases that is still increasing, a very slow rate of increment, uh, in the la in the last weeks has increased a little more be because Havana and other provinces has passed from phase one to phase two where transportation is possible and people are moving more. So now there is a, a call to people for half awareness about social distancing, uh, keeping the measure for not um, putting in danger uh, the response that Cuba had a uh, so far, and you can see here uh, the number uh, of recovery. In general, the, prog the progression of cases in Cuba has been very, very slow. And when then you have the international cooperation, Cuba then started to send uh, brigades for free to different countries. It started with Italy, and from that point, more countries were asking for for help, so now we have 59 countries, over 28,000 collaborators helping these countries fighting COVID-19. This business of forced labor is the functional equivalent of slavery. Esclavo yo que recibo de mi país todos mis estudios gratis. Esclavo yo que mi familia recibe mi salario completo estando fuera. Esclavo nosotros, si la teoría de ellos. Nosotros lo hacemos voluntariamente. Nadie a mí me obliga a ir a su país. Cuando otros países del mundo nos tildan como esclavos, pero nosotros eso no nos importa. Lo de nosotros es contribuir con el mundo, contribuir con la humanidad. Porque hay otros pueblos que me necesitan. No deben de morir las personas cuando hay profesionales y personas que estamos capacitadas. Voy porque soy médico. En definitiva, para eso se deben formar los médicos en el mundo, para curar personas. No importa si es en Cuba o en cualquier latito del mundo. Son como parte del genoma humano de los cubanos y simplemente ayudar a que lo necesite. Yo si no era nada más justo que nosotros pudiéramos ayudar a otros países. So then there is the acknowledgement of the population about the, the work of Cuban doctors and how the, 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 the system in general is not only the Cuban doctor, it's how the whole system and the whole country, because it has been a joint effort. It's, 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 it's not fair to say it has been only the, 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 the doctors. The, the response of the doctor has been excellent, but all the prevention, the tracing, the response of the biomedical sector, the response of the science, uh, the scientific institution has been basic for the success of Cuba in this, in this pandemic. And I want to close with this video. I'm sorry for extending so much. Hacemos los médicos porque precisamente nuestros médicos son esforzados, no escatiman tiempo para salvarle la vida a las personas.
aplausos por, por su gran trabajo, por su esfuerzo. Es muy grande lo que ellos hacen. La alegría es la mejor medicina que hay para el ser humano. Siempre estamos seguros de, nuestro, de nuestros médicos. No tienen ni los medios necesarios, pero salvan las vidas y están ahí. Muy orgullosa, muy orgullosa de mis médicos, de, porque es que son lo mejor del mundo. 100% confianza y seguridad de la medicina cubana. Porque el país ha hecho todo y ha gastado todo, 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 todo para que nuestro pueblo se sienta seguro y se sienta fuerte y, y podamos combatir esta epidemia tan grande. Great, thank you, Valia. That was a really, really useful um, introduction. Well, a really useful speech. The slides were really fantastic. Um, we will be making the video public um, on our Rock Around the Blockade website. Um, and on, on the Facebook page. So, you know, if you missed any key statistics, then you can go back and, and, and see that. Um, I can see um, that Ria has posted a petition. Um, so we have been, you know, pushing for Britain to collaborate with Cuba on containing the virus. And we've been pushing a, a petition to the Cuban, to the British government. And um, so it would really help us out if you could sign the petition and share it. Um, okay, um, so I am now going to introduce um, Ed Augustin, um, who is joining us from um, Havana, um, from Cuba. Um, so you've seen some of his, well, not just his, but the, the group that he's working with, Belly of the Beast. You've seen some of the, their amazing videos and just the fact that, you know, they're, they're on the streets of Cuba and providing that platform for Cubans to speak. Um, so yeah, Ed, we'd love to hear from you for sort of five, ten minutes. Um, just about your work, about, you know, um, Belly of the Beast, and yeah, I mean, yeah, take it away. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks so much for the invite. I just saw um, the tail end of Valia's um, talk, which was really good. Um, and yeah, sorry for, for, for coming late. Part of that is because I'm a chronically disorganized person, but another part um, is because I spent the morning running around trying to get um, antibiotics for my girlfriend, um, and there aren't any of the, of, of, she needs two types, and one is in stock at the moment, and the rest of Havana we haven't been able to find the other part, and that, that is um, plainly linked to the US sanctions on Cuba. I mean, this is a long-running um, problem, decades long. I've been living in Cuba for seven years, and it ebbs and flows, um, and the state press, uh, to be fair to them, are quite frank with the population on that um, when they're low on medicines. And now, during a time of pandemic, um, when, I don't know if Helen or, or Valia would have touched on this in their presentations, but um, as a result of the US blockade, um, uh, humanitarian donations um, to Cuba, including medicine and face masks and ventilators, haven't been able to get in because of the sanctions in the time of pandemic. Um, of course, the sanctions adding to the pandemic, it's, uh, create a huge economic strain that makes it difficult for Cubans to get medicines. And, and this is just a very concrete, palpable example of how um, it affects you know, some, someone I know here. And, and not, not to make that my, that, that my excuse of being late, but it kind of factored in. So, and, 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 and I think it's, it's, it's always useful to give concrete examples of how the blockade just makes life more complicated in so many different levels here. Um, yeah, so, so my name is Ed. I'm a journalist here. I've been here for seven years. Um, I, I do, uh, I, my, my journalism, uh, I, I do both kind of mainstream journalism for The Guardian, I'm their correspondent here, um, and I do a bit for Al Jazeera, broadcast amongst other people, but I, I've also been working these last five months for Belly of the Beast, which is a, a left-wing operation, um, and the idea behind it the slogan we've got is Cuba from the inside to tell Cuba's untold stories. And there's a big vacuum for, 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 for positive stories and real stories about Cuba that um, are often told by the Cuban uh, state media, but the audience is primarily domestic in Cuba. And because of the limitations they, they have um, financially and in terms of having a high like, production polish, um, there, there, there are limitations there. And then you've got 
um, dozens of foreign correspondents, but because they respond to other interests. There's a whole host of stories that are either unexplored or underexplored. And we set out five months ago to, to US sessions on Cuba, which, which, as everyone knows, I'm sure, um, watching this started in the 1960s. Um, so it's been going on for over half a century and have been hugely reinforced over the last two years, particularly by the Trump administration. Um, and we're going to be showing that in a series of um, documentary films entitled Trump's War on Cuba. And it's a bit of a provocative title because it's not really Trump's War on Cuba at all. And he, he, he is interested in... in okay, can you hear me? Yeah, great. Go ahead. Um, so, thank you, Sam. Uh, yeah, so, so, so that was the focus of our... Of our of what we wanted to do with Belly the Beast. Um, and then halfway through pre-production, COVID came along and we just thought that it was incumbent upon us, um, first of all, because it's the news story of the year by a mile, um, but also because Cuba's response, as, as various people have been talking about and this whole chat is about, has been so unique and special and successful. We pivoted our, our production to um, cover that. Um, and in terms of, my experience in covering it, um, sometimes it's frustrating working in Cuba because Cuba, to simplify the way I think of it, is Cuba is a country that is at war in, to all extents and purposes. Sanctions are economic warfare. And so Cuba reacts like a country at war. And um, over the years, there's been so many um, um, planted stories against Cuba. You've got the Miami uh, Cubans with the links to the US state that there's an awful lot of money. 20, 25 odd million a year to generate negative stories about Cuba, that Cuba's very on the defensive. It's got its guard up about foreign journalists. So it's very difficult sometimes for us to cover um, and get the access that we want um, because um, Cubans rightly are suspicious, um, and as the Cuban state particularly is suspicious about foreign journalists and, and, and their intents because they've been burnt many, many times. Um, and um, so, so, so access has been a, a challenge for us and that can be frustrating so in a long we're in a long um process of, of confidence building with the humans to get the access that, that we want and the sanctions are inseparable from this because if you look at the helms burton legislation um in the 90s that makes it incumbent on any u.s uh, administration to 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 get as much information as possible on the operations of the cuban economy in order to sabotage it so you can see how that sets up a uh, um, an incentive for any state under sanctions to, to have its guard up about people prying around. Um, in terms of covering it, we've covered quite a lot, as you saw with the Doctor Speak video, doctors who um, are, are part of the Henry Reid missions who've been on well over, who, who've been sent to well over 20 um, countries, uh, Africa, Latin America, and for the first time ever Europe um, since the pandemic broke. And covering that, just to, to be honest, has is, is just been an honor. Um, I don't use that word lightly, and I hope it doesn't come across corny. Um, seeing this small, downtrodden country being the only country in the world to send doctors, thousands of them, thousands of doctors and nurses abroad, just, just, just to bear witness to that and to speak to these people um, before they go on mission is, is it's an amazing thing to, to witness, and, and I feel very privileged to, to be here because there are other countries that have sent. Um, aid. China has sent aid to Cuba, amongst other countries. China's sent some doctors to other countries, but they've sent doctors to train up other doctors. As far as I know, Cuba is the only country in the world to have sent significant amount of numbers of doctors, nurses, technicians to directly um, fight COVID on the level of patients. And that is um, just, just, just an extraordinary thing, um, especially when we see how selfish um, um, European countries have been um, and, and, and it's not limited to Europe. And it's amazing to speak to these doctors because being a, a journalist here, I find it amazing how much Cubans, the, the agency of Cuban doctors is stripped away from them by the media. In other words, we never hear their voice. So we have all of this propaganda campaign driven by the Trump administration about how they're slaves, which is ridiculous. There is, there are, um, it, it's a complex problematic thing about Cubans going away to work. It, it, it's, it, 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 it's, as, as doctors, it's presented in the state media as, as purely noble and disinterested. Well, I think in most cases, it's, th th there is a real altruism that's alive in Cuba, but also people go to top up the salaries. Of course they do. 
and um, there are um, constraints on movement and things like that when people go. But to say it's slavery is a grotesque lie, and also uh, and, and 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 they know it. Um, and then on the kind of liberal end, you have this kind of you know we see it in the Joe Biden campaign, like well you know it's, maybe it's good in terms of the, the 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 results, but of course Cuba, all the money goes to the regime anyway. Way. they're forced to go and 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 they're, and they're just trying to export communism and it's just very paradoxical that you never hear the voice of the cubans that supposedly it's implicit in all the media coverage that we're supposed to care about so much so just trying to fill that void was uh, seemed very important to us um and then on the domestic response uh, uh, as as valia was talking about um the it, 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 Cuba's had a huge success. Um, it's, I think, the most successful country in the Western Hemisphere and being able to contain it. And key to that success has been um, isolation of people who have COVID, but also hospitalization of them, um, unlike, for example, in the UK, where you're just you know, expected to kind of like ride it out in, in your own house many times, but also isolation of people who've been in contact and who are suspected cases. Now, we showed that in our video about the isolation center. And and I think that that was um, we, we we felt it was important to get that covered. And another um, facet of Cuba's response has been what's called here pesquisa, active screening. And it's and it's been Cuba Cuba has a, a great capacity, not only the political will to do it, but a great capacity to do it because it has the highest doctor to patient ratio in the world. Even when um, all of the ten thousand or so doctors that are posted abroad subtracted from the total. So if you're a country with the highest amount of doctors. Per patients in the world, it's about 110, 120 patients per doctor. And there's a huge amount that they can deploy. And these doctors are rooted in their communities. You have the family doctor, family nurse, there's about 13,000 of each in Cuba, um, who are expected to look after um, um, hundreds of houses within a radius of just a few blocks from where they live. So they know their patients, they categorize them into four different cat categories of risk. So when a pandemic comes along, they know who the most vulnerable are beforehand. And they're able, and, and 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 they have the addresses, and it's incumbent on all doctors, nurses, and Cuba's thirteen thousand or so, sorry, twenty eight thousand medical students to um, knock on doors and look for for symptoms. And we, and we tried to show this with the active screening video. So overall, um, it's been yeah, it, um, we I felt very honoured to be able to cover it and 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 try and shed a tiny bit of light and cover this amazing. Um, um, amazingly successful, both domestically and internationally, um, go that he was had at containing, managing, and hopefully in the long term, em uh, eliminating uh, COVID. And I think that um, yeah, it, it 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 feels like a privilege to be able to 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 shine some light on it because it's so chronically undercovered because. Um, because of political interests. Thank you, Ed. That was really helpful and um, really useful. And we've all really enjoyed um, watching the Belly of the Beast videos. So um, we're going to move to um, the discussion section, question and answer section. Um, we've had a number of questions already coming in. Um, I would like to bring in um, Aristides. Um, Hecharia, who has joined us from the Cuban Embassy in London today, and um, it would be great to hear from you. Um, I also have um, Netpa Freeman, um, who's wanting to speak afterwards, and then we have a few other questions from Cassandra, from Scott. Um, so yeah, and just to say, if you want to, if you have any questions or you want to make a point, please um, send me a message um, directly. Um, you can message me as a co-host directly to Sam McGill. I will make sure that your question is noted down and yeah, I'll, we, we will take questions and, and also let the panelists um, come back and, and speak to them. Thanks. Um, so Aristides, it would be great to hear from you. Okay, well, um, good afternoon. First of all, I want to thank you for inviting us to this wonderful activity. I want to thank uh, Helen, Valia, and Ed, because they have made a, a great presentation with a lot of details, a lot of useful information. Uh, in the case of Helen, 
as you know, it's someone very well informed about Cuba. And in the case of Valia, it's someone with a, a lot of years, a lot of experience working in Cuba as a doctor. And uh, also I want to uh, thank uh, Rock around the blockade because of the great work you are doing to spread the word about Cuba. You know, Cuba, this a small island, 11 million people since 1959, is been trying to uh, develop its project by itself, but unfortunately suffering a permanent aggression by the United States government. And during the pandemic of COVID-19 uh, has not been different. Unfortunately, during this uh, period, the U.S. government is uh, enforcing his uh, sanctions against Cuba. Uh, of course, you know, we, we have a great uh, capacity, a, a great capacity of resilience to overcome every obstacle that the United States government imposes. us. Now, recently, uh, they are trying to, as other people said, they are trying to demonize the international cooperation we are doing with other countries. I would like to say that in the case of our cooperation with third world countries, that, ba that is based on uh, South South cooperation, that is on the United Nations uh, frame. So what we do with uh, many countries in the South South cooperation, in a certain way we cooperate each other. We we are, uh, we complement, we work together. For example, in the case of Venezuela, uh, we can share with Venezuela human capital. We, we have many doctors, we have, no, it's not only doctors, we have uh, engineers, we have uh, sport trainers, we have many things in the capital field that has been the result of many years for by the revolution. And in that way, we can share that with our uh, countries and our countries can compensate that uh, uh, to us with all the things they have. That's why, as Valia said, from the very beginning of the revolution until the 90s, we all our international cooperation was for free. Uh, of course, during the special period, as, as, as she mentioned, we, we found an alternative. But in the case, for example, of Haiti, Cuba, if the cooperation Cuba has with Haiti is for free. It's impossible Cuba ha could uh, ask Haiti to pay on what we are doing. And now in Haiti, we have, I guess, more than 600 doctors, specialists working there. Working when, when the earth, earthquake happened, uh, that moment, um, there was an attention to Haiti. About that moment, years before Cuban doctors were there. And when everybody left, Cuban doctors remained there. So our cooperation is not in a, in a, in a, in a situation that we, we would like to get a benefit of revenues. What we would like is to cooperate. And that's what we have been doing. Um, as, as Valia said, now we are in 38 countries with 45 brigades and that, those brigades has, uh, uh, have 3,772 members. So that's what we are doing. We are, we are not exporting the revolution. It's, it's impossible to export the revolution. Probably what we are exporting is the example that, that, that what could be done if there is a will to uh, take care of the people. And of course, that's something that the United States government doesn't like because it's a bad example that we are, we, we are doing, imagine, an 11 million people on the developed country facing many sanctions, many difficulties, and we are doing this. What could be done in our countries with more uh, capacity, more resources without the permanent aggression of the United States? Uh, but that's, that's what Cuba is doing. That's what Cuba is doing. So thank you again. Uh, I, I, I won't uh, say anything else. If, if someone would like to have a, um, 
an explanation of something specific, but I, I believe that the presentation of Helen, Valia and Ed was amazing. They, in the case of Valia, she provided us with a lot of information, very updated with many details. So I appreciate uh, what they did. And thank you again for uh, to uh, rock around the blockade. And for Cuban, in, in my case as a diplomat, when you go out and you are in a you are abroad, and you find in a foreign country people that respect what Cuba is doing, what is the case of uh, rock around the blockade? That's something you feel proud of, and that's something that uh, gives you the strength to continue fighting for what we have, for improving the, 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 the project we have with many difficulties, but at the same time with many achievements that must be known by the audience. Unfortunately, the big media uh, didn't say, or uh, don't say anything about that, but we have to spray the word. We have to say, well, there is a small island in the Caribbean, poor country, but they, they, have, they have this as a result. And it's not said by us because it's, it's could uh, sound uh, not modest, a Cuban saying that what we are doing. It's said by international organizations, it's said by United Nations, it's said by um, um, other people that know what we are doing with a lack of resources, but uh, as a great will to put people in the center of the project, to put uh, people in, in, every, in the center of every action we take to protect our population. Thank you very much and thank you for the 84 people that are right now at the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aristides. Um, yes, um, you know, if people are able to support us, um, you, we have um, ways that you can donate to Rock Around the Blockade. We are trying to um, produce another pamphlet and um, we produced this pamphlet the revolution Re revolutionary cuba the streets are ours um, over 10 years ago and we are now wanting to update it and um, so we've been working on that we'd love to produce another pamphlet to get out there and speak to people on the streets of britain and um, again we've been organizing protests against sanctions picketing um, petrol stations of esso and um, exxon mobile for their law lawsuit against cuba um, and yeah, I mean, also what, you know, what Aristides was saying about supporting the independent journalism that is actually showing, you know, Cuba as, as an alternative, showing socialist Cuba and, and what it is being able to do, going against the, the flow of, you know, the mainstream media that just, you know, um, has so many manipulations. And so, you know, you can subscribe to our newspaper, Fight Racism, Fight Imperialism. Um, you can also please um, support Belly of the Beast so that they can produce their documentary about Trump's war on Cuba. Um, so I'm going to take now um, Netfa Freeman, who joins us today from the US. Um, he's with the International Committee for Peace and Justice and Dignity, and also the Black Alliance for, um, for Peace. Um, so um, Netfa, please, please speak. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Sam. I'm going to be very brief, and thank you. I was asked to do this, uh, uh, just to give actually the stark difference between the United States and Cuba. The United States right now, as in, in stark uh, contrast to Cuba, is the epicenter pretty much. I think only second to Brazil of the pandemic, and actually not only just the pandemic, but the economic, um, the economic uh, disaster that that's, that it's actually uh, buttressing. Um, but actually, the disaster is not only because of Cuba. I'm going to just run through these these slides really quickly um, that I have here. Um, it's not, I mean, economic disaster, not from Cuba, that's not what I meant to say. It's not from the pandemic. It's uh, the economic disaster was is inevitable because of neoliberal capitalism, and the pandemic is only accelerating that issue. Uh, some basic points that I want to just make and then get off and if people want to ask questions, is that um, there's virtually not, there's not enough testing being done because of not the, the gross inefficiency of testing, contact, contact tracing is really not uh, very possible or being very efficient here. There's a rush to get people back to work at the end of the thing because that's how capitalism thrives. Healthcare is tied to employment in the United States and other, and so if you don't have a job, you, you know, usually people get their, their employment benefits, um, their healthcare benefits through their job. 
Um, if you don't have a job, then you normally don't have to have, you can't have health care or you have to pay for it. And it's too costly in the United States. Um, there's a massive unemployment because of the pandemic. A lot of things had to close down and couldn't withstand the long term periods of being shut down and actually closed for, for good. Um, and there's just astronomical numbers of people applying for unemployment insurance. There's a rabbit on the part of the system, the rulers, I, was, I call them the rulers, the state and the corporations, a rabbit focused on vaccines to the, to the neglect of treatment. So just trying to, you know, everything's so based on just, I don't know, it's just reaction. But Cuba can have it under control and not just Cuba, but some other places have had much more success than the United States and they're not doing it with a vaccine, but there's this rabid focus on vaccines here. And then if they do have a va vaccine, they're really already poised and, and having reports talking about it being accessible to the, to, to the rich. Uh, first, and, and the, the, there you know, concerns about the rich not really, or other people, most affected people not having it. They can, I already said that, the economy can't really withstand this, this long uh, sh close down or, or partial close down. It's a complete conflict with how capitalism works in terms of this production based on profit. Um, there's two uh, actually needs from the workers who are exploited by capitalists and the capitalists actually share a need and that the capitalists want to make money and a profit and the workers need income. Well, in a sense, of, it's not a conflict because the workers just need to have income even while there's a close down. So it's not because of the work. And then something's telling me something here. Oh, maybe it's not for me. Move this away from, okay, maybe I'll just be quick because it's saying move the, the application away from the, the the Zoom, but I can't really do that while this is going. Economic package relief is in disarray. IRS is in disarray. The economic package relief that they give to people is not even adequate, but they're about to end it because they just, the, the system is not designed to give people uh, social uh, safety net things that, that other countries adore. Some industries are even profiting from the situation. Some are in dire straits because of it, but some are profiting, like Amazon, for example. It, it depends on uh, you know, mailings and, you know, what you call it, the, the you know, uh, when you buy things online, have it shipped to you and all that, that's a big part of that corporation. So they're making millions of dollars of profit off of the, the situation here. Uh, Jeff Bezos to private profit, but other country, other industries and other work things are struggling, particularly small things. Black and First Nations people, uh, working class people are being grossly affected by this. There's a lot, a spike in number of uh, I mean, it's just so crazy in terms of how many people are dying. Uh, they started talking about it before in the beginnings of it, but now the media is doing a strange thing where they're not really talking about these uh, very stark realities for people. They're talking about some things, but things, things, the reality they're really trying to pen play down. There's a lot of political posturing going on by politicians, the Republican Democratic Party, trying to use the situation to benefit themselves in the election time. There's a lot of selfish there's a culture of selfishness and individualism in the United States. Their interpretation of freedom is so skewed. They, they, they have uh, the precautions that we need to take, that's just messed up slide there, that people need to take are not being abided by, like masks and things like that. The social distancing, so a lot of people are seeing that as infringement on their right. Um, and so that's what we're facing here. I, that's just a really brief sketch. There's a whole lot more that I could tell uh, as a lot of people know, there's been an uprising because of the police killings and whatnot. And so there's a, the, this, the pandemic has actually accelerated and made a very acute, the very, um, the, the class dynamics, uh, race class uh, uh, conflict in the United States. And so that's what we're facing right here. And I'll, and I'll just stop with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Netfa. You have our solidarity from here in Britain. Um, many of the comrades here in different cities have been participating in week, in you know, weekend after weekend after weekend of Black Lives Matter protests, trying to get the word out there about what is happening and what continues to happen in the US because our media has gone very quiet about it and also about the same issues that crop up in Britain with you know the amount of deaths in police custody um, and yeah so you know we, we are absolutely in solidarity with you and it's great to have you today. Um, so I have a few questions now and um, so I have a question from Scott about Guardian well about journalism and, and that's I guess directed to Ed 
Um, and also one from Candice about how the um, doctor's brigades function, like what the logistics are. And one from Cassandra about interferon um, and some of the differences about those. So I'll take all of those questions together. And um, please message me if you have a question that you want um, to ask. I know there's a couple of other people who've requested to make points. Um, and then, you know, we can go back to the panelists. Um, so yeah, um, Scott, take it away. Hi there, uh, it's just a yeah, question for Ed, just how does he feel as you know a, an honest journalist when reading some of the, well quite frankly, hatchet jobs that have appeared in the Guardian regarding Cuba? Thanks very much Scott. Um, Candice, do you want to ask your question about the Doctors' Brigades? I'll just give um, Jacob a minute to unmute. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Uh, cool, so um, I just wanted to say that um, I wanted to ask about how the logistics of the international brigades work. Um, I've been reading the We Are Cuba book and I understand that students of ELAM are obligated to work in the communities for free or in other over impoverished places, but there's no mechanism to actually Im enforce it. So are the doctors that go on the international brigades, are they, um, are they volunteers? Are they paid more? Um, are there like targets for the number of doctors that go on the brigades and how are they met if there are? Um, just like a, a bit more details on the logistics if that's possible, thanks. Thank you. Um, Cassandra, do you want to ask about um, the medicines question you you, you had? Yeah, um, I want to say thank you first of all though to the speakers. They were fast. All the talks were so um, interesting. I learned so much. I have a question for Valia, and I was just wondering what the differences are between interferon alpha that is being you know used in Cuba and interferon beta, which obviously were being has been used in Britain, but is now come into the spotlight with coronavirus. And I was just wondering if you could um, like elaborate a little bit more on what those differences are. Thank you. Great, thanks. Well, um, I'll return to our panelists now. Um, just if you do have a question, please message me in the chat, just explain what it's about and I'll make sure I take it for the next round of questions. Um, so Ed, if you're still with us, do you wanna address the question about the gen journalism? Yeah, can you hear me? Go ahead. Go so ahead. I'll get to the journalism. Just, just, just the second question about the logistics, very, very quickly. Um, the um, nobody in Cuba, no doctor, is obliged to go on the mission. In fact, the missions are oversubscribed. Um, I know people who don't like the Cuban Revolution that live here. That are, the 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 criticize the government that the feel that they're that they're not they've got lots of other criticisms um, travel um, sometimes a minority of times i think in brazil you had less than 10 percent of the doctors in the end staying and trying to live on in brazil sometimes it's as a route out of the country but that's you know less than the the, the, the rate of desertion as a supporter is actually quite low um, um and I think, frankly, most of the time it's to top up their salaries because Cuban doctors, although the Henry Reeve Brigade doesn't charge, those on the Henry Reeve Brigade um, do earn far more money um, uh, than, than they do back home. And that's a legitimate thing. Like, I don't think, but personally, I'm firmly on the left, but I don't think we should be um, bashful about talking about money as, a, as, as, as something that um, is useful to us. And, 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 and as a Brit, you know, born into you know, middle class, Britain, um, Cuban salaries are really, really tight, and they're particularly tight because of the blockade um, and Cuba's choice to, to to ensure that the social services are still there um, post the fall of the Soviet Union. They've had to, you know, two plus two is four. They've had to repress salaries in order to square that circle. So, so, and and my main point here is that that makes even more of a laughing stock out of the idea that they're slaves. Um, they're, 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 I mean, this is like really vulgar propaganda um, and pe people pe people want to go so much that there's even often like low-level bribery of like I'll give you twenty dollars or twenty cook if you can like put me up the waiting list hugely oversubscribed and you don't have to go um, and and um, those who go um, come back for holidays my understanding is it's one month every year they come back that's all included 
Um, and if you've got a personal reason where you know you're two month, two years in or six months into a mission and you don't want to do it, you can come back and you incorporate yourself back into the medical system if you want to keep working there. So there's not really, I, I haven't uncovered in my reporting any sanction for not going along with it, even after you signed up. Um, on the question, the, the dicey question of being a, um, a freelance journalist for The Guardian, I'll, I hope that um, no one, um, uh, my editor, isn't part of this discussion. Yeah, it's complicated. Um, um, I think that The Guardian, I mean, I, I don't feel part of The Guardian. I don't, I don't have this like clubby mentality, like we at The Guardian. I'm quite, uh, you know, I, I use it to earn a bit of money and more importantly to try and get the information out. Um, of course, I've got conflicting feelings. Um, about some of the pieces they've done about Cuba. I think in, in, it worse is the coverage of Venezuela um, in general, even when things were much better in Venezuela, even when Chavez was you know, elected again and again and again, any human, um, indicator, economic indicator that you looked at was increasing. Um, and the Guardian's coverage, particularly the Rory Carroll, was just hatchet job, hatchet job, and very well done but very, very, very well done hatchet jobs that were quite difficult to, de to take apart because you'd often focus in on things that were true, but magnify them um, and not talk about other things that were true that may doubt that the government was doing a good job. Um, so, so yeah, um, I think that I, I'm working for Belly the Beast now and we are, this is a group of, of, of I'm working, I'm, I'm British, two North Americans and we're collaborating with Cubans here on the island. But we've got a huge problem in terms of getting, the, getting things out. I mean, we, we've, we've, we've had to go cap in hand to rich socialists, millionaires, mainly in the US for funding. And we've only got funding for, I'm not doing this to plug project or looking for, for funding, but it's difficult to make it sustainable. Um, and it's very difficult to get them out. I mean, we've got, we've got an advertising budget of thousands that we're yet to spend because Facebook <laughs> blocked us because we're based in Cuba, which we're contesting. Um, but even if they unblock us, you know, we've got to give our money to Facebook and it's, it's horrible um, to, get, to get it out. Um, whereas when I do jobs for The Guardian, the last article I wrote about Cuba's domestic response, I think it had 8,000 shares. Um, Belly of the Beast, our videos are getting thousands of views, not shares. Um, so it's orders of magnitude more people I can reach by working on it, which is why I like to work on both. And also, I mean, Al Jazeera, you know, it's Qatari state propaganda. They cut a lot of people's heads off. I think 85% of people living there are not um, citizens, embroiled in slave labor, building empty skyscrapers. Um, horrible and horrible in terms of COVID. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's a mouthpiece, essentially. And when I did, the, I did a piece for them, when the first Henry Brigade left to Lombardy in Italy back in March, and 350,000, so this is 100 times more people than any of the thing we've done in Belgium, so necessary evil, perhaps. Um, I'm sure in response to your question, you know, that most people here are as cognizant as I am, that you know, there's structural biases in media in every country, including the US, that's not including the UK. Most journalists are quite posh. Um, people have disproportionately gone to private schools. Um, there's often this kind of like sarky attitude of the Guardian of like, if there's a leader like, you know, Fidel back in the day or Chavez, that, who's got popular support, there's often this kind of knee-jerk reaction to them, like poo-poo them and oh, like, we're far too clever for that. Um, and yeah, I think that all plays into how it, how, how even liberal or left-leaning domestically in the UK with The Guardian, or left in the UK, um, uh, journalism, when it comes to Latin America, where there's so little coverage, it's a, it's a strategy of legitimation, unconscious, I think, of, of a way of kind of like shunning and discrediting uh, political projects that have got mass support and are making people's lives better. And, and, and I think there's a huge elephant in the room in, in all mainstream coverage. I don't think British coverage is as bad as US coverage, but it's still pretty bad, um, which is that though the embargo, sanctions, blockade, whatever you want to call it, is talked about, the human impact is never talked about. Um, the fact that it's making, that, that it, it messes up everything, that it makes it more difficult to get fertilizers, that if you stop petrol, ambulances won't be able to run, that power cuts make people's lives a pain, people die, sanctions kill, even in Cuba when the country is so adept and resilient at fighting them. 
that fundamental truth that sanctions kill never gets out. That's the elephant in the room. So I'm trying to kind of walk a tightrope between earning enough money to live, um, getting the message out, but also working on, um, you know, projects like Belly of the Beast, whose values I agree with, which I'm more aligned to, but we've got to accept that building this up is going to take a huge amount of time. Um, and, the, and the problem of reach in, the, in this digital age controlled by oligopolies is, is, is always going to be a, an issue. So maybe that sheds some light. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, I'd like, thank you for mentioning Venezuela. <clears throat> That's something that we campaign on as well. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, definitely the, the, the coverage of Venezuela and, and Cuba and, you know, um, Evo Morales' is Bolivia, it, it's all backed that kind of attack on, on you know, the, the movement for socialism in, in Latin America. And um, so I'd like to bring um, Elias in at the, right now and um, just to talk about an event that I know is happening in solidarity with Venezuela. Um, and just to say, I mean, I know we were wanting to wrap up about half past seven and uh, there's a few announcements and I'd like to bring the panelists back in at the end. If you have any questions, please put them in, my, in the chat to me right now. I will let you ask them before we go back to um, Helen and um, Balia. Um, so Elias, please speak. Hello. Um, so as most of you will have heard, uh, uh, the Bank of England is keeping um, like Venezuela's gold reserves in in London. Um, I think the value is near to a billion dollars, and uh, they're saying that um, they don't recognize Maduro's government, and this uh, these reserves belong to Juan Guaido. But actually, back in 2018, when Guaido was unknown not only in Britain but also in much of Venezuela they still would refuse the Venezuelan government to withdraw that, those gold reserves. And as you, most of you will also know, Venezuela is going through a very tough situation, um, especially now under um, a US, like US sanctions, which are uh, almost as bad as, uh, okay, I mean, Hassan has put down here. So that's around uh, $1.2 billion or 800 million pounds. And uh, right now there was an urgency to withdraw those reserves to buy, well, to pay for the response um, against COVID-19 because uh, another fact about Venezuela now is that it's actually had a really good response compared to other countries in Latin America um, against uh, COVID-19. But it's gonna be it's still like they're still having a very hard time. Um, so they do need, um, that uh, they need do need like foreign currency to uh, pay for imports. So the Bank of England, since they're gonna uh, hoard all of this gold, maybe even get it to wider on so what they're gonna be doing with it. Um, um, so then we're gonna have a protest on August fifteenth, and it's gonna be like a physical protest. Um, so that means that uh, on August fifteenth, as you can see in the link that Cassandra posted on the chat, we're, we're going to be going to the Bank of England in London, and we're going to like show them um, that we we're, we're not going to uh, like let them get away with it. I mean, essentially, they're like stealing all these codes. Um, so do. Um, send a message saying if you're like interested, maybe in the um, Facebook event. And we also want to like prepare a lot of placards and and handles and so on. So it's it'd be really great if everyone can like can come that like, comes to this protest. Tell the Bank of England that they're not going to get away by like stealing Venezuela's gold, especially now in this um, with like the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, so yeah, we'll expect most of you over there, and we hope that you can come and yeah, reclaim this call. Thank you, Elias, and if everyone could help by liking and sharing the event and getting the word out, you know, even if you're in different countries, you know, please um, help us to spread the word. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we now have a few questions, and um, so I'll take these before we go back to the panelists. And um, so we have um, Shard. 
Um, Ori, would you like to speak? How are you spelling that? Sorry. Um, so we C H A A R P. Um, I might have got it. I got it wrong as well. Yeah, cool. Thank you. you. Should be unmuted now. You can speak. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Right. Thank you so much uh, to everyone. Uh, I my name is Chan. <laughs> I am a physician, and I'm from uh, Washington D.C. is where I'm currently located. Uh, I did want to send solidarity to everyone who is fighting uh, the war that the U.S. is imposing on uh, people around the world, especially right now, Cuba. Uh, specifically, the questions that have been happening that we've been having in our community have been around how to adopt these models of care that exist in countries like Cuba in our local communities. Uh, it's come to a point where I've had to leave my job at the hospital because I was being threatened uh, for my anti-racist work. And, and, they're, and, they're, and we're really trying to adopt these models uh, of how we can do contact tracing on our own, uh, isolate people on our own, just because there is nothing coming from the government. Is there, uh, what are the ways that healthcare workers like me can communicate with uh, either Cuban resources, um, some way get there, I don't know how that's gonna happen, but. Uh, are there any resources that we can access um, uh, to learn more and adopt them in our local communities? Thank you. Um, Hannah, um, you have a question about the older population. Hannah, um, sorry, I should have took your surname. Hannah Kala. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Helen, Valia, Ed, Aristides, and Lepa. Um, it was very fantastic to hear you speak. I feel very inspired. I think the thing that is the most significant for us in Britain is to see the house-to-house -house visits by doctors and nurses and students, um, to know that um, you know the Cuban healthcare workers know their population and their community in advance of this, and the fact that, that as Valia said, the, the Cuban doctors and nurses want to see people rather than this terrible thing happening in this country where people feel to stay at home and turned away not being able to access um, healthcare necessarily. And I think the, the deaths in other the care homes for elderly people in this country have been so horrific and shocking. Um, and the fact that now there are some homes who are saying they can only have one visitor for half an hour every week. I mean, we are gonna kill people by isolation and psychological distress um, and mental torture um, in, you know, in this country. And it shows what capitalism, how savage and brutal it is. Whereas as everyone has said, you know, Cuba, you know, led by the ideology of the communist party and building socialism has put people first and it's inspiring. And I wondered if any of the speakers could say something about what's happening to the elderly population who can't live in their own homes in Cuba. Thank you. Um, Danny Acosta, you wanted to ask about the US blockade. Yeah, can, can everyone hear me? Yeah, uh, congratulations to all the speakers. It's been fantastic presentations. I just want to raise an issue that has been mentioned a couple of times, which is the US blockade. And the US government recently announced sanctions for a Cuban ban in London. And the issue is, is the extra territorial effect of the US blockade that even people from fair countries in Britain and Europe, they get affected. And mainly it keeps happening because um, there is not a resistance to these uh, uh, punitive sanctions. For example, here in Britain, as a Cuban citizen, when I go to the Cuban embassy to pay for my passport, I have to pay even with a postal order or, or find a way to pay because Britain uh, have find it very difficult to provide the Cuban embassy or Cuba business with uh, safe banking. So I wanted to ask the Aristides from the Cuban embassy in general, uh, with this uh, persecution against Cuban finance, how is Britain and Europe responding uh, to Cuba? Have they guaranteed that it's not going to confiscate any assets or things are going to be working by normal? If you have any comments in relation to the blockade, and what can we do as Cuban and also citizens of these countries to prevent uh, bans like HSBC or any other ban uh, imposing these sanctions uh, 
on British, British citizens. Thank you, Danny. Um, okay, so that's all the questions that I've had. Um, I have um, got people that want to make announcements, which and I will take an announcement section at the end. So on that list, I've got Ria, um, Nina, and Irene. I hope I've said that right, sorry. Um, Irene Houston. And so I've got you three on the announcements list. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten about you. If anybody else has sent a question to the panelists that I've missed, please let me know now. Otherwise, I will hand it back over to Helian, Valia and Aristides to address some of the questions that have been raised. One second, I've just seen. Oh, OK. Um, so there was a potentially a, a question from Robert. Is that a question, um, Robert, that you wanted to ask? Oh, and sorry, I did have a question um, from Maxine. Um, so go ahead, Maxine, if you'd like to speak. Maxine Sadza. Um, and Robert, if yours was a question, um, indicate now and, and I will take you after Maxine. Um, I'm Maxine and I'm, um, I'm um, a biomedical scientist working for the NHS. Um, and my question was about treatment because there's been about a bit of contro controversy about chloroquine, especially um, that uh, Trump has been advocating it. Um, so I saw that um, the, Q the, uh, the Cuban medics have been using chloroquine along with other treatments. Uh, what has been the, have, have they found any adverse effects with patients? Um, because there's been things like head, uh, severe headaches um, uh, and has it, it seems to have been successful with um, people who don't appear to have the symptoms um, and also with the patients which were not very sick. So can, if, that one, um, if I could just have an answer to that. Thank you very much. And um, also, thank you for this session and the speakers have been amazing and it's been amazing to hear what's going on um, in Cuba and around the world and uh, solidarity to all the Cuban medics. So oh, um, Helen, Valia, Aristides, um, who would like to come back first? I don't know if Aristides, you want to address some of the, the questions? It was too many. I don't remember the order. So okay, I okay. Quick. I will go very well, quick. What just answer what you can. <laughs> okay, if I don't remember something, please just remind me. Uh, first, about collaboration. I think Ed already addressed that. I want to say that Henry Reef works in different principles than the other collaboration. Henry Reef is free and go to disasters. Some people are members of the brigade and they are specifically trained to deal with that. So that is a different concept. Depending on collaboration, Cuba likes to go to collaboration as and before that, he, if they license, uh, likes to go before, like it, like it, to go to international missions because we Cuban are friendly, we are adventurous, this is one thing. We have this humanitarian side. Everybody that knows Cubans, you know we are like that. But also it's an economical contribution. Even before, during the international mission, even when they were not paid, even the pocket money and the possibility to go to African countries or other Latin American countries, open a window to solve some small economical things they didn't have at home. So it's always an opportunity. And with the medical collaboration, it's even better for them because the government keeps around 20, 15 percentage of what each country is given for each of the doctors, but they remain, they kept the, the, the rest. And that, that goes directly to the bank account in Cuba and the other money they use in the country where they have. And at the end, they, could, they make a good amount of money and they need it because it's not a secret that we live in a very tight condition with many economical issues. And that is why, as Ed says, the list for going to collaboration is very huge. People go voluntarily and they are eager to go, doesn't matter where. Even when they are working in very hard condition in remote, uh, inaccessible uh, places. So it's a combination of both. So regarding the chloroquine, I already answered something in the chat, but because it came again, so I'm going to answer. So I, I also had the question, so I was asking some friends in ICU and other doctors working in Cuba, everybody answered the same. And I saw a paper, I can share it, 
later when I finish about this. Um, so Cuban is aware of the controversy around the chloroquine, but we have a lot of experience using chloroquine because of malaria. So we don't have malaria in Cuba, but in, to the country that we go in Africa and also in America, Central America and South America, they have malaria. So we are used to deal with that and we are used to deal with chloroquine as a preventive and therapeutic treatment for, uh, for malaria. So that is one thing. So we have experience using the, the drug. And right now for COVID-19, they are using uh, chloroquine in very low dosage um. in patients that don't have complications and also they don't have important uh, risk. And also uh, at the beginning, so now in patients that are very sick. So that is the way that uh, it's been used in combination with other. And the results speak by themselves. <laughs> so the recovery is very good. The death rate is very low. Um, there is not important side effects. So that is the Cuban experience with the chloroquine, even when we are still following controversy that is going on in the world about the use of this, uh, this drug. So the other question was about interferon alpha and beta. So yesterday I was talking with Helen about that. I said, I'm going to ask my technology people because I know someone is going to ask. So the receptors are the same, so, and the signaling response is similar between alpha and beta interferon. In the case of what Cuba has uh, developed is alpha interferon time ago. So this beta interferon was developed by a company that is called Seed Ergine, Seed Ergine or something like that. This is a lot of money and the stock market has been growing a lot around this company, this is a lot, a, a lot of money involved. The response is good, but the response of Cuba Alpha uh, interferon, it, it is quite good. There is a, a 50% of negative, uh, negativation, I can say that in English, becoming negative, patients becoming negative at the seventh day. And when alpha interferon is combined with gamma interferon, the response is even better. There is a 70% of patients becoming negative at the day seven. So we don't have enough patients to do clinical trials because we go to the community and we're chasing people when they start developing symptoms very early on for saying, so that is another difference. For, for comparing the two, the two types of uh, interferon. So we have low cases and we are intervening then very early on in the first stages of COVID-19 when the symptoms are, are very mild. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it was something else I didn't answer, so sorry. No, I think that was the main, the main questions. Um, obviously, you know, if there's any way where like you, the US doctors that um, Chan um, was mentioning can, you know, um, relate with Cuba, um, then maybe if you could send him a direct message, that would I be brilliant. I already did it. I already wow. did it. I sent several links of publication about contact tracing in other yeah. diseases because it's too soon to, talk, to, to, to publish about contact tracing specifically in COVID-19. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, so I will um, hand it to Aristides now, and um, if you'd like to talk a bit more about um, the blockade and some of the issues that um, Danny raised, thanks. Okay, um, I would like to, going back to the question about uh, doctors, if they are going abroad, volunteer or not. Uh, let me tell you that it's the same attitude. The doctors now going out is the same aptitude that the Cuban people had when we were in Africa fighting against upper hate. So it's completely volunteer. It's impossible to have abroad. In the, right now we have 28,000 plus 3,172 uh, doctors working abroad. It's impossible to, to have that amount of people obliged abroad, they, they are doing that as a uh, volunteer. Let me tell you something about our, how we understand solidarity. We understand solidarity and we understand collaboration, international collaboration with other people as a duty is 
we, we feel that acting in that way, we are paying a debt with humanity. Our leader, main leader Fidel Castro said that we, the Cuban revolution was not or will not be alive if we can, could have uh, international solidarity. So uh, since the very beginning of 1959, we, we have been working with other people, providing our help. And it's because also uh, there is a reason in, our, in the history of the Cuban population we have received a lot from our for our countries. Uh, probably you know that in our in the history of the fight of, of the, our independence, we we received the contribution, for example, of Che Guevara. He was an Argentinian, so we also received in the independence war uh, against our metropolis, Spain. We received uh, the, the the support from um, Maximo Gomez, who was uh, born in Dominican Republic. So in our gene as a nation, we understand that we have a debt with humanity. And also uh, our main hero, Jose Martí said that homeland, homeland is humanity. So Cubans, the majority of the Cuban population understand that we have to do something for the rest of the world. It's not, we share what we have, it's not too much in terms of material things, but in all the things we can share what we have. So uh, definitely our, our doctors uh, are going out uh, volunteer. Um, in the case of the question about um, the sanctions that Danny uh, made, well, let me, let me clarify something. What was uh, published recently with OFAC, the, the Treasury Department, office in charge of the sanctions against Cuba was an updating. So the bank in the, that, that was mentioned there, the Cuban bank that was mentioned there, has been in that list since the 90s. Now the US government updated the information of that bank, putting the new address, the new, uh, um, more, more data about that bank, but the bank has been there since the 90s. So you, uh, as a Cuban, uh, and all of you, if you feel solidarity with Cuba, I believe that you must uh, raise your voice to denounce every action from the United States government against Cuba. Uh, as you know, Europe and the UK, every year they, they uh, the UN, they, they uh, support the resolution that Cuba present against the, the blockade. So that's a position, the official, official position of the, of the UK government and the uh, uh, European Union. That, that's a position and they have been keeping that position against the, the US will, of course. And now, as I, as I said, what, what you can do is it's, it's a straight away to raise your voice and denounce what is happening. It's very difficult. Uh, you must know that financial uh, markets and that banks are mainly controlled by US. So it's very difficult for Cuba to find a way for all its transactions. Uh, but we will try to find um, how to do it, how to do it. And I guess I hear that Hori, Hori, he's, he's from, oh, he's now in United States, right? Hori, he's from United States or he, he was uh, in United States and he was asking how to, to get connected, connected with Cuba. I, I suggest those that are in United States to get in contact with the Cuban embassy in Washington DC. And those that are abroad, in our country, I would like to uh, get involved in solidarity with Cuba. I suggest them to uh, get in contact with the embassy of Cuba in the country they are. Okay, that's my... Thank offering. you. Thank you very much, Aristides. Um, okay, can I um, bring <sighs> Helen, Dr. Helen Yaffe to come back and then we will move to announcements. Thank you ever so much for everybody's contributions. Okay, thanks everyone. It's been a fascinating discussion and um, I've learned a lot. 
Um, my book, as Candice mentions, has a chapter on Cuban medical internationalism, an army of white coats. There's also another chapter called The Curious Case of Cuba's Biotech Revolution. So I don't claim to be an expert on the difference between everyone alpha and beta. <laughs> and I was quite pleased, I have to say, when I realised that Balia didn't know until she checked. So. <laughs> But um, yeah, you, you can read more about that there. I mean, I'm, I'm really pleased that the, 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 with the comments that Aristides made, because I think that sometimes uh, when you live in Cuba, which I have done, and when you are Cuban, you can sort of slightly lose sight of what's exceptional about the way that people think in Cuba, the way that they're brought up, the fact that their first lessons at school, they are taught that cooperation is better than competition. And there is this tradition, a revolutionary tradition, a proud revolutionary tradition of internationalism, um, which you know Aristides was referring to Che Guevara, the War of Independence. Henry Reeve brigades are in fact named after a, a US, uh, someone from the United States who supported Cuba in the uh, wars of, War of Independence against Spain. That's why they named it, because it was a brigade initially set up to help to you know give that help back by helping the people of New Orleans who were being left to drown and die after Hurricane Katrina. So um, and that tradition it was also it's a tradition of like being the young being revolutionarily active and that we saw with the literacy campaign of uh, 1960 when you know 700,000 Cubans went all around the country to teach their compatriots, to teach their, um, you know, people in their country to read and write. And it's that spirit that every generation also wants to be at the forefront of contributing. And there may or may not be a, a material, personal material incentive. But the fact is that it is having a planned economy which prioritises welfare, not private interests pursuing profit that allows Cuba to be able to reap the benefits of its investment in social welfare. And so when the blockade squeezes and squeezes Cuba and stops it being able to just carry out normal trade, the Cubans had medical um, services, healthcare services to turn to as an alternative source of income. Yeah. So, you know, it very quickly with the relationship with Venezuela became the most important source of income for Cuba. But, um, you know, thank goodness that they had that and they had that because they are a socialist planned economy. Every year, the Cubans plan how many doctors do we need, how many nurses, how many anaesthetists, how many, you know, so on and so forth. So it's, it's none of it's left to an accident. Um, and on this question, I just want to, I don't know if this is cheeky, but I want to read one paragraph from an article I recently wrote for Le Monde Diplomatique on uh, how the world rediscovers Cuban medical internationalism. It says, the revolution of 1959, which shaped the Cuban view of solidarity, combined the values of national independence hero Jose Marti with Marx's analysis of capitalism. Taking up the battle prize from Marti, homeland is humanity, and Marx, workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains. Cuba's revolutionary leaders sought to promote a global struggle against diverse forms of underdevelopment, imperialism, colonialism, and neocolonialism. They view global poverty and poor health as a result of these exploitative structural conditions. The post-1959 public healthcare system was constructed on those values. Free universal state provision was endorsed as a human and constitutional right. Cuban medical internationalism is an extension of those principles overseas. The other thing which we haven't, I mean, Balia talked about ELAM, the Latin American School of Medicine. Cuban medical internationalism is not just outward moving, it's also inward moving. So it is people coming to study in Cuba, ELAM was, was one example, but actually tens of thousands of people from Africa and Asia and Latin America have had already uh, studied in particular, well, less from Latin America, from the post-2000 period, more from Latin America. Um, and then there is the treatment of patients. So, you know, we're hearing that, you know, uh, the Sky movie on Chernobyl is winning a BAFTA or may have won, I don't know what the news was, but, you know, 
um, the Cuban contribution in relation to the, the nuclear disaster of Chernobyl is barely mentioned. And yet, over a period of um, oh, bad maths, I don't know, what was it, uh, 21 years, 26,000 people from the region, Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, received medical treatment in Cuba without paying a penny without paying a penny. And this started, by the way, at the very beginning, or just before and continued through the very beginning of the special period. So when, you know, Cubans were suffering from electricity blackouts, when there was hunger, not starvation, not death, but hunger in Cuba, when there was, um, you know, very little to go around, they still put aside resources to to care for people who are from thousands of miles away who they have no direct material benefit from helping so you know this is the spirit of the cuban revolution and this is the spirit that we need to take on by combating the u.s blockade i mean aristides was also talking about the un that britain takes a position against the blockade so does the european union correct but they don't do anything about it so there is legislation in britain in the you know British Parliament passed legislation, European Parliament, the and individual countries within Europe, the UN has instructed uh, different all member states to pass legislation to say that the US blockade is not applicable to their citizens and companies from that country. And yet, because no court action is taken those uh, punitive fines and threats from the United States, from the Office of Foreign Asset Control, the US Treasury continue to put people off from engaging with Cuba, from trading with Cuba, from investing in Cuba, and most importantly, in the context of a pandemic, from benefiting from Cuban advances in healthcare and biotechnology. So we all lose out. So I would say to anyone here who's not already involved, if you're in Britain, with Rock Around the Blockade, the, the, the thing is in the name, yeah, we are, the, the campaign is set up to combat the blockade, show solidarity with Cuba, and if you're in the US or India, I know there's people here from those countries, then get involved with uh, campaigns with those countries. And you know, we are, we are all, um, we all have to take this on as our fight. Sanctions kill, as Ed said, um, they kill in Venezuela, they kill in Syria, they kill in Libya, and they, they if they don't kill in Cuba, it's because um, you know the Cubans have made terrible, terribly difficult sacrifices because they have a socialist planned economy that that manages to you know share scarcity among them, and that has what is what has kept them alive, and that is what has limited COVID nineteen in Cuba during this pandemic. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very um, much, Helen. And um, can we just sorry? Just to add something very small. Okay. That Britain also have profit from Cuba solidarity very recently, and that was the Bremer Crucial. So where many people were abandoned in the middle of the Caribbean and no one was able in the middle of the pandemic to accept these people because they didn't have the conditions to do it. And starting fighting the COVID-19, Cuba accepted the, the passenger and they returned safely to, to the UK. That is also solidarity. Yeah, thank you for that important reminder, Balia. The HMS um, Braemar was, you know, right at the beginning of the kind of lockdown for, for us or just before the lockdown. And again, it really shows the difference between the socialist response to COVID-19 and the capitalist response to COVID-19. And you have only to look at the death rates and the economic crisis and the impacts in the US, in Britain, you know, and then obviously the, the devastating effect on the, on the countries that, that Britain and the US oppress um, to understand, you know, that the, the fight between socialism and, and capitalism is a fight for all of humanity. So it's been really, really helpful and useful to hear from all of you um, today. Thank you so much. Can we just have a round of applause for the um, speakers? I wonder if um, Jacob can unmute everyone so you can actually hear, I don't know if it's possible. And if not, you'll have to just, you know, make do with our hands, but everybody's clapping. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so before we close the meeting, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate we've overrun slightly less than a Fidel speech, I will say, but um, we'll just move on to some um, announcements before we close the meeting. 
um, and I will ask um, the people who've been posting the links just to keep posting everything now because remember when the meeting finishes and um, the chat will be gone so make sure if you want to sign a petition to demand um, Cuba uh, that Britain co uh, collaborates with Cuba please you know take the petition um, link now there's another petition there about um, you know and demanding that Cuba is recognized as a Nobel Peace Prize winner and um, for its contribution and um, to the fight against COVID and obviously there's all the links to Helen's book to um, yeah all, all the different um, organizations to the newspaper to a belly of the beast fund and um, so please um, post them now and um, take them down so um, I'll move to Ria then. Thank you for the announcements. If anyone else has an announcement, just message her quickly. Um, yeah, mine's not so much an announcement as a contribution, but thank you to all the speakers. Um, I'm a member of the Revolutionary Communist Group and Rock Around the Blockade is actually our campaign. It's a campaign that we set up in 1995. Um, and last year I was on the brigades that Rock Around the Blockade sent to Cuba and something that kept um, coming up from various conversations with Cuban people was that what we can, what they need most from us as people that live in Britain is political solidarity and that means us um, going out onto the streets and building um, a movement that is inspired by the example of Cuba and that is based on the principles of socialist Cuba. So that is um, anti-capitalism, anti-racism, anti-imperialism um, and socialism. And that's exactly what the revolutionary communist group is doing. Um, and it's amazing to have this meeting and to have the discussion and it's good to learn but we don't just want to know for the sake of knowing and discuss for the sake of discussion we want to learn this stuff so that we can go out and apply it and um yeah from knowing stuff we don't help anyone we don't change anything it's actually by going out there and building a movement um inspired by socialist cuba a movement that can actually challenge the poverty, the racism, the war, the environmental destruction that is part of capitalism. Um, that's what we need to be doing. So yeah, like Helen said, it's up to all of us to build that. So if you're not already involved, if you're not already a member of the Revolutionary Communist Group, then now is the time to join us in building that movement. And you can, um, you can contact myself in the chat or Cassandra if you do want more information about how to get involved. We can find it on our website, which has been posted into the chat um, a number of times. Thank you, Ria. Um, I'll move to Nina um, from the Cuba Island Solidar Cuba Support Island. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yep. Uh, uh, so this is Nina from Cuba Support Island, CSGI. Uh, thank you so much, Sam McGill. You did a wonderful uh, job there. I'll make it really quick. Um, we love amplifying everything you, um, all your news and all your events. They're, they're really good. Um, just a couple of things. So um, we believe that the recent European Court justice judgment in the Max Schrimm's case against Facebook and the Irish Data Protection Commissioner opens up the opportunity to stop EU data being transferred to OFAC in Washington through SWIFT. Uh, this is the main uh, financial institution used to enforce the blockade. I'll put the link onto this because it has the details of a letter that you can send to each one of your banks. So we'll circulate that text in our letter and you can copy that. Um, also, we are organising a 60 kilometre walk, uh, one kilometre for each year of the blockade, uh, which will follow in historic route, the route of 1,400 starving Irish people who were the victims of British imperialism during the potato famine in 1847. We will march under the banner of the British imperialism 1847 equals the US imperialism 2020, and we hope to raise funds to send to the Henry Reeve Brigade. However, we already know that no bank in Ireland will transfer those funds to Cuba because they're all enforcing US blockade under SWIFT, uh, which is really the helms Breton Act. Uh, uh, we will use the refusal to highlight the tentacles of a blockade in Ireland. Uh, we also have the support of members in the Irish Parliament. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for everyone. And, um, you know, let's all be in solidarity with each other. That's great. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Nina. Um, I'll take Irene Houston from the Cuba Glasgow Film Festival. One second while Jake. I got it right first. You got it right first time, Sam, Irene. Oh, am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. Go for okay. it. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, thanks, Sam. I'm, I'm saying you got it right the first time, Irene. But um, so oh, thanks so much, everybody. I think we've all said that it's been it's been really excellent. Um, and I just wanted to say one of the other things that, that Cuba is um, brilliant at, of course, is culture. And that's more, that's um, I run the um, direct the Havana Glasgow Film Festival with um, Danny. Where's Hi, da you wait. So Danny and I are working on the next Havana Glasgow Film Festival. This is the sixth one. It's going to be online this year. But um, we also we're going to be. I I also have them. Um, Helen's book. Um, and we're going to do a few. I just wanted to say, is Ed still here from Belly of the Beast? We're going to do as part of the film festival. We're going to do um, a feature on Cuban doctors and on and show the film on and, and on belly of the beast so um we're running in in november from sorry running november from the 10th to the 15th oh hi ed i was talking to reed i've been talking to reed online and watching your documentaries and we're going to do i'm, I'm looking forward to working with belly of the beast um on the havana glasgow film festival uh, this year we're going to feature you, we're going to feature Helen's book, we're going to feature Cuban Doctors as well as lots of other films and things so do follow us on Facebook and it, it's Cuba's so, um, well I'm waving my hands about it, I see, it, it just, culture is such an important part, um, medicine, science, culture and uh, thank you so much you guys for, for all you're doing because that is so important to get, to get all that Cuba's doing in so many different aspects and film is the way to do it. And speaking as a documentary maker, I'm hopefully be able to support you and help you in the, um, you know, donations for the for for your for your documentary. I, I think this is really important, um, what you're doing in Cuba. So, and thanks to everybody. That was great. All you and um, everybody there. Thanks very much. Um, yeah. So please um, follow the link for the film festival. <laughs> Great. Well, I hope everybody um, enjoyed today as much as I did. Um, really appreciate all of the speakers' contributions. Um, again, I think you know what um, Helen was saying at the end um, of her contribution is really important. You know, this is the U.S. blockade against Cuba is tightening. The escalation is increasing, and Cuba needs our solidarity now. And then that leads into what Ria was saying, that it's not just about, you know, solidarity with Cuba, but actually this is a fight for, you know, the future of humanity. You know, you've got the issues with COVID-19, the environment, you know, this economic crisis. And um, so, yes, a, a lot for us to think about. And I hope if, if nothing else, um, people will leave this meeting thinking that they want to take some action. And um, so please, you know, um, Take the links down and um, you know um, support the belly of the beast in getting their news out and um, support rock around the blockade in whatever way you can and um, get a copy of our newspaper or a subscription to it um, and yeah I mean get involved wherever and however you can.